hands up and can't hear me. Fantastic. That's quite loud, obviously. Uh, so, hello and welcome everyone to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon. Um, yeah. Hands up if you've never been to one of these salons before. Oh, that's quite a few. That's good. Nice to always see lots of new people. Um, do come back. We've been running for about eight years. We've got lots of groovy talks and events on. Uh, we generally run last Tuesday of the month. Um, next month we have Nina Lyon. She's got a book out called On the Trail of the Green Man. Um, we're talking about all that kind of mythology and deep mystical stuff. And then, actually, the month after that, it's already sold out, I'm afraid, but that's uh, Jeremy Narby, the author of The Cosmic Serpent. He'll be coming along. And there'll be more after that. Uh, Frederic Michael Fischer, who's a, who was an underground MDMA therapist uh, in Switzerland, who was then thrown in prison for for it, and then did a doctor, got a doctor as well, she was, um, after she came out of prison, uh, is coming to talk about MDMA therapy, and uh, somebody else, Christopher Lees in May, is talking about, he's uh, one of the leading researchers on Parkinson's disease, just across Queen Square there, the Institute of Neurology, he's talking about how William Burroughs inspired him to go to the Amazon and drink ayahuasca, and how that gave him insights into Parkinson's disease that fueled his whole career. So that's in May. Uh, I don't know what's happening in June, something else probably. Um, meanwhile, uh, back here in what month are we in? February, uh, we have uh, Chiara Baldini uh, with us tonight. Chiara has come from Portugal. And Chiara spoke at uh, various events that have been involved in the Breaking Convention, it's a, a conference on uh, psychedelic consciousness we organise at the University of Greenwich and she gave two staggering talks there, one for the Fentigens panel which we organised uh, last year with Maria. Where's Maria? Where are you? Is it? Oh, Maria's at the back. And myself and Maria and Chiara are uh, editing a book on uh, the feminine and psychedelics uh, which will be out hopefully next year. So that's some of the stuff, stuff we do. Um, Chiara is an independent researcher and writer. She's also a curator and event organiser at Boom Festival X and now a Fusion Festival in Germany and uh, she's talking tonight about gender, ecstasy and the revolution. Ooh. So please give her a warm welcome. Thank you everyone, thanks for coming. I'm really glad you all came. This talk became some sort of viral sensation that <laughs> we didn't really expect. I didn't expect. I didn't put the word orgy in the title, which is <laughs> what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I'm happy you came. I think this information is very important, and I'm going to do my best to be a good channel for this information. So my research. Um, since about 10 years I've been following a personal research, book after book, a bit at random, but then always, um, then more and more finding uh, my own way, that realizing that I was researching the evolution of the ecstatic cult in the West. So how altered state of consciousness, techniques to induce altered state of consciousness have been embedded in different rituals in the West. And especially I've been focusing in Greek and Roman times. Because for me it's a bit the core of Western culture, but also I realized because I'm Italian and it's a core of my culture. And so also because actually in Greek and Roman times, techniques to induce alter state of consciousness were very common. And uh, usually they were grouped, the, the rituals where these techniques would be used were grouped under the term mystery religions. I don't know who of you is uh, familiar already with this or not, but tonight we will uh, analyze some of these mystery religions, specifically the Dionysian uh, mysteries and the uh, mysteries of Kibili or Cibele, as I said. So, um, our focus points are going to be what were the ecstatic rituals and how did, the, how did they challenge the socially accepted norms con concerning gender identity and other social conventions and what was the reaction of the ruling class. So we are also going to explore a bit 
what was uh, the social political implications of these uh, practices. So we're going to start with Dionysus, Dionysus as the English say. <laughs> so I'm sorry my Greek is non-existent. I know here there is a couple of Greek people. I know you're going to cringe every time <laughs> I'm going to pronounce a Greek word. I'm sorry. I'm going to do my best. And uh, so Dionysus is quite a popular guy. So I was curious to know how many here have never heard of Dionysus. Is there anyone that never heard of him? So see, everybody heard of him. So he's quite a famous guy still now. And mainly he's famous for being the god of wine and intoxication. I'm sure all of you know about this aspect of Dionysus. So usually he's also represented as the drunk guy. You can see him here being served, uh, supported by different people. And uh, so this is a common association of him, but actually I would like to talk about the fact that an earlier association of him is with a vegetation god. So originally he was defined as the power of the tree, the blossom bringer, the fruit bringer. So he is representing the Dionysian energy is the energy that pushes the plant out of the seed. So Dionysian energy is the life energy, is the vital power of life, and it's life willingness to reproduce itself. So this is a very archaic kind of energy to worship, let's say. So vegetation gods were worshipped in fertility rituals since a long time, probably since uh, before even the Neolithic times. So Dionysus as a vegetation god is defined by Karl Kereni, he's one of the main uh, scholars researching Dionysus, as the archetypical image of indestructible life. So life, willingness to reproduce itself, vital energy, vital impulse to bring uh, blossoms and fruits and life on this planet. So to explain what this is, to give really a, uh, a clear idea of what this is, I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip that was circulating on Facebook lately, and I thought it's, it's exactly what Dionysian energy is, so I'm going to show you a bit. kind of energy that brought us all here. This is also the kind of energy that creates sexual attraction. This is the energy that pushes people towards each other and also then creates more life. This is the energy that pushes the penis up, for example. And I'm saying this because the next image is also about another aspect of Dionysus, that he's famous for being the god of sexual pleasure. I put this image here because it's a nice mixture of sexual pleasure, wine and intoxication together. This is Dionysus, the other guy is a satyr. The satyr is a mythological male figure. He's a half man, half horse. So he has the horse tail, he has the horse ears, and he's always ready for intercourse. <laughs> And the satyr is also where the word satirical comes from. So the satyrs are usually represented as the guys 
playing around with sexuality, making it funny, being uh, satirical about life. So uh, then Dionysus is also known as the uh, being associated with celebration, parties, the, the strong ceremonies. And the Euripides in the Bacche, the Bacche is a fundamental play where there is a lot of information about who is Dionysus and how people in the 5th to 4th century were seen, before Christ, were seeing him. It was uh, uh, shown for the first time in Athens in 405 before Christ. And uh, so in the Bacche, Euripides call him Lord of the Dance and Giver of Ecstasy. So Dionysus is a bit, is the kind of guy that is always a bit on the edge of the Greek pantheon. He's always a bit the outsider. His name was first attested in ancient Crete, on the island of Crete, in 1300 before Christ. So the Greek felt that in a way he was part of their own culture, but at the same time he was associated with divinities and rituals coming from Asia Minor. So he's a bit Greek, he's a bit foreigner, he's not really part of the Greek pantheon like Zeus or Apollo. Those are the Olympian gods. He is more ancient than the Olympian gods. So he has this role of being a bit in, a bit out. And also because his rituals are very wild and extreme. They use... <laughs> there was a quote that they couldn't find anymore, but the quote was saying, a quote that was a comment from those times, how can a god that makes you mad be a god? And this is quite a legitimate question to ask still now. How can something holy be at the same time completely outrageous, completely irrational, completely... It's about being out of your mind. So I wanted to show that even back then there, were, there was this kind of doubts and questions like is this really a rightful kind of worship? Is this something ethical to do? Is this something good for the good people, the good citizens? And also he was a bit an outsider because he was very popular among women, homosexuals and slaves. These are three categories of inferior beings in Greek culture. So he's the kind of guy that attracts this kind of not so right citizen people. And so one more reason to look at him with this kind of, uh, mm, we like you but we don't like you at the same time, on the side of the institutions and the establishment. So who were his followers and what happened in his rituals? We will start with, from the beginning with the most ancient rituals that we know of in, during Greek cultures, worship in Dionysus, was performed by women only. The name of the ritual was Ore Basia, from Eis Oros, that means to the mountain. So it was a ritual performed by women only that uh, left the town and went on top of the mountains once every two years, in the middle of the winter. And the mountain would be as high as Mount Parnassus in Greece, which is 2,500 meters. I don't know the feet, but it's a very tall mountain. So these women were called menads. Menads means mad woman. From my minus thigh, that means to rage and to go mad. So these women were women in their full female power, something that maybe we cannot even imagine so clearly anymore, but they knew how to go fully in this power, leave the town, run on top of the mountains. Often they're described with surprise as going bare feet and uh, with, her, with their hair down, with these crowns of ivy. Ivy is a Dionysian symbol because it's an evergreen plant and it grows on top of what's dead. So it brings life back on what's dead. So again, it's a symbol of life energy. They're wearing fawn skins, so they're entering into this mountainous, wild realm, wearing, like, dressing like animals and... Uh, um, um, the group would be called the Tiazos. This is the name of the sacred band is also referred to, the group of women. And it would be composed of women of all ages. Euripides says the young, the old, and the maidens. 
So the young would be the mothers, the old would be the crones, and the maidens would be the teenagers. So a group of women of all ages going on top of the mountains alone, and uh, what would they do there? That's the question. So the manners are professionals of ecstasy. What does it mean? So there, there is this quote from Diodorus, they dance in imitation, in imitation of the manads, who are said to have been associated with the god in the old days. So the manads are dancers and they practice ecstatic dancing. We don't really know what that looks like because this kind of tradition has been uh, interrupted once Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire and that marked the end of paganism. So all these pagan traditions have been interrupted and we don't know anymore exactly what kind of ecstatic dance they were practicing, what kind of movement, but they knew because uh, in, the, in their times the lineage of this tradition was uninterrupted. So they knew from the elders of their group how to dance in a way that would be ecstatic, would allow them to enter into an altered state of consciousness. We know that they would throw the head back a lot because there is many uh, images of them with the head back and we know that they would do specific movements and we also know that probably they chanted repetitive words in a way almost like mantras. So they would use a series of techniques coming down from a very ancient tradition that would allow them with the body to go into another state of consciousness. So they're then, if they're dancing ecstatically, it also means that they were experts of ecstatic music making. So they're often represented playing the frame drum, that is a typical uh, way to represent manat. And uh, yeah, so they were incredibly skillful at creating the kind of rhythm patterns that would induce the right mood in the women. And also this we have lost and slowly we are regaining this kind of knowledge, but yeah, I like to say that they knew how to do it in a very professional way. They were trained and they were trained also by older women that were teaching them. So then another technique that they would use to enter into an altered state would be the use of psychotropic plants. We don't know again exactly what kind of plants. Uh, Dionysus is associated with wine, but Greek wine is not our wine. It's always described as a mixture of different things, and not just the fermented grapes, but also with a, a bit of other things added to the, to the pot. And so this uh, pot that I photographed in the British Museum the other day, here you can see the melons adding different things with different containers. And yeah, it's very interesting to go in the British Museum. There is two rooms full of vases with images of Dionysian traditions because mainly these vases were used for uh, bringing wine in the rituals. So it's really, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I uh, advise you to go in the British Museum. So they would use uh, different plants probably. They were going on the mountains, maybe they were using okay. mushrooms, maybe they were using roots or uh, seeds or uh, barks, we don't know. Um, what we know is that this kind of knowledge of women using plants, going on top of the mountains, dancing, dancing to repetitive music, this is the same tradition of the witches. So these girls were the great, 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 great grandmothers of the witches. This is the same lineage that has been, uh, that survived uh, until the witches and then with the witch hunts again the tradition was uh, cut. Another technique that they would use would be ritual sexuality. This is because we can infer that this is what they would do, because it was a common practice in ancient fertility rituals, and their tradition, their lineage, come from the ancient fertility rituals. And also because in a later, more urbanized version of the Dionysian worship, when, we, when also men uh, joined the women, 
uh, we know that that's what they would do, they would practice ritual sexuality and we can know this also because some of them painted these scenes on the vases. So I'm going to show you one image that is the kind of vase that usually is in the underground of the museum. <laughs> so far. <laughs> so all of these techniques would help them to enter into another state of consciousness, which they would call mania or divine madness. So this divine madness they would describe as being possessed by the God himself. So it could be described as being in full contact with this vital energy, with being alive, with feeling what it means to be alive on the, on, on the earth. And um, uh, for example, the word enthusiasmos, enthusiasmus, that uh, they would use a lot to describe this state, has Theos inside. So to be filled with God is the same word like entheogens, this enthusiasmus. It's about feeling God inside. And if God, as we said, is nature, is nature life force, it's about feeling alive. And uh, uh, again, Euripides in the back calls uh, Dionysus, he refers to him not only as Theos, which usually would actually be the anthropomorphic form of the god, but he calls him daimon, the root, the same word that we use now, demon. So daimon for uh, Euripides is a kind of supernatural force, is a divine force that manifests as a supernatural force in the form of an altered state of consciousness that takes possession of the people in the ritual. So Dionysus is this supernatural force it's not just an anthropomorphic guy, uh, God, but he's a supernatural force that come and possess the people. In fact, bake is the uh, Greek word for um, to revel that was used to describe uh, them, and also Dionysus was also called bakos. So bake is not just to revel, it means to have a specific kind of religious experience to become, which would mean to become Bacchus, to become God. So Plato says, many are the Tirsus bearers, few are the Bacchantes. What does this mean? This means that it was not enough to go there with the Tirsus. The Tirsus was this wand that they would carry, made out of fennel, a fennel stalk, with a pine cone on top. This was a typical thing that they would carry with them. The fennel stalk is very light. So they could dance with it, and it would be like a symbol of being a bacante. So Plato says that it's not enough to be where to bring the tirsus and wear the animal skin, and then you are a bacante. To be a bacante is about really allowing this force to come inside you, and we can imagine it would be quite an ordeal, or we know that it's not so automatic. So I think this quote of Plato is quite interesting because it shows that. There was this kind of awareness that being a bacante was really about entering into another state, allowing yourself to be possessed by a supernatural force. It was quite an experience to have. So because of all these reasons, the menads were seen like the god himself. We like them, but we not really like them. They're kind of weird. They go on the mountain, they dance alone, and God knows what they do, and they get a bit crazy. Not even a man should be doing that kind of stuff. So imagine women doing that kind of thing. So they were always seen a bit like uh, strange, like also the witches later. Because in a way, menadism did not affirm traditional feminine roles. It was not the typical housewife that was already existing, going on top of the mountain nor did it offer examples of appropriate behavior, like what the right, what the good woman is supposed to do. It actually legitimized alternatives and some measures of autonomy for women. So it was quite revolutionary on the side of these women to be performing this kind of rituals. But so this kind of aura of mystery that they had around, because all mystery religions, whatever happens in the rituals, it's covered by secret. They're not allowed to talk about what happens in the rituals. So it, the, there was a lot of negative rumors spreading around that um, uh, 
uh, they were giving away the milk that was supposed to be for the children to the wild animals and they were attacking villages and they were fighting with the Tirsus wand against men that had a sword and the sword would break. So all kinds of crazy legends. And I'm going to read now a quote from Pentheus from the Bacche. So the Bacche is the story of Dionysus that arrives in Thebes. And he calls the girls, okay girls, let's go on the mountains and let's do my rituals. And Pentheus is the king of the town and he says, no, 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 I don't like this story, I don't like my women to go with you, who are you, you are a foreigner, foreigner. you look like a woman, I don't like you, my women are not going to come with you. And so, and then he, he goes on to explain what he thinks that the men and do on top of the mountains. I hear the bowls are full of wine at their feet, amid their feasts. Sorry, but I cannot read. And they, I, how do I do this? And they sneak off to this or that deserted spot to service men in bed, pretending to be some kind of raving priest, but serving instead of Bacchus, goddess Aphrodite. So he's calling them a sort of perverted sluts, basically. <laughs> so they have this uh, uh, fame, like this, they, they, they are famous for being uh, perverted and maybe also a bit dangerous. And uh, here I wanted to talk about something that I just recently found out, that here in England, during the Victorian time, now we jump into just recently, in the 1800s, end of the 1800s, during the Victorian times, when the suffragette movement came about and this new um, figure of the new woman that was fighting for her rights, that was uh, uh, being, behaving in a different way than the normal, acceptable Victorian woman, when this movement came about, some comments came out in the press co making a comparison between the new women fighting for their rights in the suffragette movement and the men. So I'm going to read a few uh, quotes from that. Um, the, the unwomanly and unseemly tactics of the political men and the vote-desiring bacchanal. This little knot of men these insurgent wild women are in a sense unnatural. They have not bred true. There is in them a curious inversion of sex. So they're not real women. They are a bit too much like men. Hereafter, this outbreak will stand in history as an instance of national sickness, of moral decadence, of social disorder. This, was, this is from this uh, uh, magazine called Punch. But at the same time, there were other people that were looking at the menads as a positive example of admirable act of female rebellion. So for example, Jane Ellen Harrison, that is a famous scholar of the beginning of the 1900s, she calls them an alternative to the Victorian spinster. So I think it's interesting how this uh, image of the men had survived along the centuries as a very powerful uh, image of a very powerful archetype of this wild woman that is scary but has a lot of power and goes it can pose threat to the accepted to the order to to society at large these kind of women that are rebellious and almost act like like men they're really uh, a national sickness <laughs> so in reality, what were these kind of rituals? I'm going to give my interpretation. So they were deep contact, they were moments of celebration of life, deep offering the possibility to have a deep contact with nature, with wild animals, with plants. And it was this deep and most intimate communion with the wilderness that they considered their spiritual practice. It was also a very precious chance to have a deep contact with each other because back then women were segregated in their houses. They were not supposed to go out, they were not participating in public life, in political life. So these, uh, uh, these were very special occasions to be with each other, 
to have a genuine, finally, to express themselves in a genuine way without being observed by, by men, and also to give vent to intense emotions, to finally scream and let it all out and use these spaces to get the frustration out of living in a society that was already patriarchal, hierarchical, misogynist. And there were also these rituals, trainings in liminality. So liminality is a very important concept to understand the Dionysian worship. Liminal, liminal state is the state in between. So a liminal state, for example, is when you fall asleep, but you're not awakened and you're not sleeping yet. You are in between. So these kind of rituals were possibilities for people, in this case women, to experience with being wild and being civilized at the same time, being men and being woman at the same time. So being both, but being neither at the same time. Being crazy, but being sane. Being rational and irrational. Both and neither. It's this uh, uh, paradox, this ambiguity, and holding the paradox without saying I am this or I am that, but finally being able to say I am both. And um, also, uh, sub, uh, psychotropic substances usually were referred to as a pharmacon, and pharmacon was both a medicine and a poison. So again, these kind of rituals, you use these substances, it can be a poison, it can be a medicine, it's up to you, they're tools, and uh, no one is going to say who's good, what's good and what's bad, it's up to you to navigate these liminal states and to have the freedom to experience all the different positions inside the different states. So with time, uh, the rituals became open also to men, and uh, the tiazos, that is again the sacred band, became a mixed group, and entire families with children get initiated. So this created the possibility for uh, people to grow up in this kind of belief system, in this kind of rituals, which was great in the sense of having the possibility to share, often for the duration of your entire life, the same kind of values with the same group of people. And often we have uh, inscriptions of tombs um, written by the other members of the group celebrating the fact that this person mm -hmm. has been partying with us all her life and she was amazing and we used to call her mentioning the nicknames like Fawns or Bucky's and, uh, I hope, and then in the end we hope that now she's partying in heaven with Dionysus himself. So I think this little <laughs> but <laughs> insight into the daily life. So the rights of Dionysus also started attracting um, homosexual men. So the rights of Dionysus customar customarily put women in the clothes of men as much as they dress men as women. So it was quite common that this place, these spaces were used by women and by men to experiment with their sexuality, with their gender identity. And in fact, male uh, homosexuality, homosexual sex, male homosexual sex, was also a practice that seemed to be uh, practiced in the rituals, as we can see from another one of those vases that are usually in the underground of the museum. This one. This is the acrobatic satyr orgy. <laughs> And Kereni says, Dionysian religion is an expression of the aimless joy of life. So it doesn't matter if this pleasure is going to create another life, it's, even if it's not aimed at procreation, it's still divine Dionysian energy, sacred. So, also Dionysus was a guy in between the genders. And they say that Dionysus was quite soft and delicate of body by far excelling others in his beauty and devoted to sexual pleasure. And in the back, Penteus tells him, where is this CC coming from? So the followers of Dionysus were also uh, like Dionysus, or Dionysus was like his followers. And in fact, usually he was represented, this is a Dionysian altar, as a pole with a mask and with a female clothes, female dress. So, 
what happened? At some point, the rituals got more and more popular, men came in and became really widespread, so Dionysus went on tour, and he went all the way to Rome. In Rome, they loved the Dionysian rituals. They called Dionysus Bacchus, and they called his rituals Bacchanals. So these spaces, once again, were very special occasions where membership was open to everyone. Women had prominent positions. They were priestesses. This means they could initiate men. And this already was starting to create trouble in the ruling class, in the most conservative part of the society, because having a woman initiating a man was contrary to the kind of stratified uh, misogynist society that was already Roman society. So these rituals broke the rigid conventions of gender, social status, because also slaves could participate, and this again was extremely scandalous and disgusting for uh, the conservative Romans. And ethnic origin, because foreigners could participate, both in Greek and Roman cultures, foreigners could not participate in uh, uh, public life and religious life. And so the sharing of all these uh, uh, radical, revolutionary beliefs created a strong bond among the participants. So for, um, ma mainly, a Bacante was first and foremost a Bacante, and only in the second place she, uh, she or he was a Roman citizen. So this for the Roman Senate could not go on. This was very scary, this could create a conspiracy, um, and uh, so what happened is that the fear started mounting on the side of the conservative ruling class and uh, a very hard repression was enforced, called uh, now known as the Bacchanals Affair. And uh, so the Bacchanals Affair is, um, has reached us through Titus Levi, that is a Roman historian. So we know the story from his words. And for example, I'm going to quote some of his, uh, from, from his book called Aburbe Condita. He says, the movement still has no power, but it is experiencing a large increase in numbers, growing bigger every day. It has almost formed a parallel city. It's very, I like this metaphor a lot. It gives us the idea of parallel city. So there is the conservative part of the society, and then there is this kind of underground alternative movement mm -hmm. that use these uh, rituals uh, to create a bond among each other and to live in a different way, to create like temporary autonomous zones in a way where for a limited amount of time you could break all the social conventions and still feel protected by gods. So, um, so from Titus Levi, uh, Titus Levi, we have uh, the speech of a consul that addressed the public assembly in Rome to tell the Roman citizens that these rituals were something really bad and they needed to be uh, repressed. So I'm going to read a bit of what he says to the Roman citizens. If I said there were many thousands of them, you would no doubt be terrified unless I told you just what kind of people they are. A great part of them are women, and they are the source of this evil thing, just to make things clear, <laughs> what we're talking about. Next are males, scarcely distinguishable from females, dancing frenetically, having lost their minds by lack of sleep, by drink, by the confusion and the shouting that goes on throughout the night. Citizens of Rome, do you feel that young men initiated by this oath of allegiance should be made soldiers? Will they take the sword to fight to the end in defense of the chastity of your wives and children? So these dancing freaks are no good soldiers, and we are a militarized society. We need to protect our city, our children, your children, your wives. These guys are not good enough to do this, and so these guys are not good Roman citizens. They need to be repressed. So they uh, promulgated this uh, Senatus Consultum de Bacchanalibus, is the name of the law, 
And it said, the priests of these rites, male and female, are to be sought out not only in Rome, but in all market towns and centers of population, so that they should be available for the consuls. No one should ever attempt to celebrate these ceremonies anymore in Rome or Italy. Then Titus Livy goes on. After the dismissal of the assembly, the whole city was seized by extreme terror. The following night, many people were caught escaping and were arrested. There was such a flight from the city that it resulted in a depopulation. <coughs> the, those who were found guilty of Bacchic worship were condemned to death. All Bacchic shrines were destroyed. So this was 186 before Christ. This can be considered the first mass repression of people practicing outer state of consciousness <coughs> that precedes the even bigger one that happened about uh, more than 1,000 years later with the witch hunts. I wanted to know how much time do I have more? Ten. Okay, so because now I was going to uh, talk a little about uh, Sibylle. So, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, start, I'm gonna try to make it uh, essential. So this is 186 before Christ. In the same years, Rome was challenged by another very radical, very wild, this is nothing compared to what's coming next, <laughs> very wild uh, uh, rituals that were the rites of uh, uh, Mother Ch Cibele or Kibeli that arrived in Rome around the 204 before Christ. So, Chibili is known as the Mountain Mother, the Phrygian Mother, or Mater, or Magna Mater Deorum. So, she is the mother of all. She is the Great Mother. She is the mother of people, of animals, of plants. She is the Mountain Mother because she comes from the mountains of Phrygia. And that's also why she is the Phrygian Mother. And uh, she's always represent, not always, but often as an um, older woman to represent the fact that her cult is very ancient. We are talking about um, Roman and also Greek um, version of the ancient mother goddess of primitive times. So uh, she's represented as an old woman, she's the mother, but she's never represented with a child. So she's really the mother of all in general. Phrygia is this area in the middle of Turkey, and there is the place where supposedly agriculture was born in the Neolithic times. So in a, there is a place called Chatal Huyuk in this area, where this uh, statue of a great mother, of a, um, of a goddess mother also was found. And I'm gonna show you, this is what she looks like, and you can see the similarities between the two of them. One is from 7,000 years before Christ, one is for 100 years before Christ. One is naked and super, yeah, I'm the mother goddess. <laughs> and the other one is dressed. <laughs> you can already see a bit of difference. But she's still holding the tambourine in her hand because the tambourine, the frame drum, is uh, again what makes uh, the connection also with the Dionysian worship. So she's also an ecstatic goddess, a liminal goddess, and uh, she presides over states in between. She is often represented in these thresholds. And um, so she is between life and death and states of consciousness and also genders. So her rights were again not advised for the good women. So someone like a woman that wants to be a good woman doesn't go to these rights. This is from a Pythagorean text of the second century before Christ called On the Modesty of Women. It says, if a woman wants to be considered chaste, she must refuse to join in secret cults of sibylline rituals, which are alleged to lead to drunkenness and ecstasy of the soul, either unbecoming to the mistress of the house. So, no ecstasy of the soul for the mistress of the house. <laughs> so, we know that also women could participate in these rituals and be priestesses of Cibele, but actually Cibele is famous for male priests called Galoi. 
and to become a, ga a gallo, a gallus, you had to go through a rituals voluntarily, which consisted in self-castration. So if it's the first time you hear about it, I'm going to give you a moment to breathe in, breathe out, especially for the guys. I'm kind of used to this information. I know the first time it really hits. But it, so you had the kind of reaction that the Roman citizens had. Like, what? These guys coming from Asia Minor, this was seen as a weird place from weird people coming from there. Coming from like a foreign cult, coming here, dancing, self-castrating. Why would they turn into uh, almost women? Why would you lose your privileged position of being a man in this society to turn into someone that is inferior? So this kind of cult created a lot of doubts, a lot of controversies, but also attracted a lot of people. It was something like, I don't like you, but somehow I'm attracted to knowing what you are about, what, what you do and who you are. So I'm going to read a bit of a, a poem by Catullus, which is a famous Roman poem and poet. And uh, so he describes from his perspective, um, the experience of a guy that decides to practice a self-castration. So he says, he entered the heavy sunless forest where his mind grew dark, and there his blood gone mad, seized the sharp stone, divorced his vital members from his body. Then rising, the ground wet with blood, he was transformed, a woman with her delicate hands, white hands, sounding the tympanon, singing to Goddess Cibele, mysterious mother of a sexless race. This for me is a really amazing quote, this part of the mysterious mother of a sexless race. To understand what was the reaction of the Romans, like who is this goddess? And these people, they are sexless, they are not men, they are not women, who are they? And so here we see the clash between a patriarchal society with a certain belief system and uh, value system and, this, and the kind of culture that created this ritual that was much earlier, that we know much less about, but must have been very different because in this former culture, these kind of people that were in between genders were actually priests and priestesses of the goddess. So it's two completely different cultural paradigms. So I'm going to go on with Catullus. This, by the way, is supposed to be a clamp for Eviratio. I found it doing my image research. I don't know how that would work, but yeah, I put it there. So Catullus go on. He awoke, looked back, and saw what he had done. She wept, poor creature, neither man nor woman. Now shall I be driven back into this wilderness? where everyone, my friends, my parents, and all I love, shall fade. I shall not walk again through the city streets, nor join the crowd who fill the stadium. Witness me, a girl, a slave of Cibele, dressed like a girlish follower of Bacchus, half my soul destroyed, and sterile I must live on this cold mountain. So this is his point of view. No? Uh, he imagines what the guy Thinks now that he's turned, he turned himself into a woman. And he says that he has to renounce his friends, he has to renounce his family, which was the case of the, with the Galli. And he cannot go to the stadium anymore. <laughs> I think at this point it relates to our culture also. These guys are not the kind of guys that would go to the stadium. And now I'm a girl, a slave of Cibele. So Cibele is starting to be portrayed as this enslaver of men, this uh, uh, female archetype that makes men crazy, that um, turns their sane mind around, makes them do crazy things. So also the writers from now on will start to uh, talking about Cibele with very negative terms and really projecting a lot of negative stuff on her, calling her even meretrix, which means prostitute. So 
it was quite a controversial story. So, moreover, the Galli emphasized their acquired femininity through woman dress and manners, high-pitched voices, jewels, and long wild hair. So again, you can imagine the Romans were not really down with this kind of behavior. The Romans were soldiers, the Romans didn't dance, the, woman, the Romans didn't go crazy, they, they were rational. And so it, there were two archetypes of mm, masculinity that really clashed with each other. And strangely enough, we can make a comparison with this kind of uh, eunuchs and another case of eunuchs that is still existing this day in India. They're called Ishras. They also pr practice self-castration and they call the self their self-castration Nirvan, a deep spiritual condition of calmness and absence of desire. So here we have the other perspective <laughs> that actually for, this, uh, for those who decided to perform this uh, uh, extreme uh, act on themselves, it was also about finding a certain calmness and absence of desire. So Hijra's main object of religious devotion is Bahu Charamata, which is another kind of uh, uh, Indian mother goddess. So this will take another um, presentation to go deeper into this kind of parallelism. I just wanted to mention it because it's like modern day Gali. They still exist somehow. They also perform very intense rites with very intense uh, emotional um, expressions. So you can see this kind of scenes the Romans would have not approved on. So what happened? Um, so. In a heavily militarized society, men had to be men, not dancing transsexuals, effeminate eccentrics with bizarre appearance and behavior. So what happened is that Roman, the Roman Senate forbid Roman citizens to practice castration. Only Phrygian people could do it. And then they created a council of real men that were supposed to guard over the eunuchs. They were called Archigalli, and they were on top of them, controlling them, and making sure that they just don't spread too much or involve too many uh, Roman men. So all of this ended in 380 after Christ, because with the Edict of Theodosius in Thessaloniki was the end of pagan um, pagan tradition, pagan religion, pagan rituals and practices all over the Roman Empire. 300 after Christ, in 600 after Christ, the people were still practicing these rituals because this is not something that you can destroy with an edict from one day to the other. And also they didn't have the kind of control over everyone that maybe the, the, our rulers have now. But so um, we have, I would like to read a bit of the Council of Constantinople in 691, where they try again to stop these kind of rituals. So we forbid dances and initiation rites of the gods, as they are falsely called among the Greeks, since whether by men or women, they are done according to an ancient custom contrary to the Christian way of life. And we decree that no man should put on a woman dress, nor a woman clothes that belong to men, nor call out the name of disgusting Dionysus while pressing grapes in the press or pouring wine in the vat, thus ignorantly and vainly committing insane errors. So I hope that this time the people are heard. But so anyway, this is the story. Now I'm going to uh, say some of my conclusions. I invite you to share your conclusions because from this kind of material, a lot of conclusions can be drawn. So I'm going to say what, are, what is my perspective. So the cult of Dionysus and Kibli are both examples of primitive practices of altered state of consciousness, providing an example of European historic shamanism.
and I want to add South European historic shamanism because there is other examples of shamanic practices that have survived from the primitive times into the historical times in other parts of Europe. And here you had the Celts and the Druids and they were also performing very similar rituals with altered state of consciousness. But these were the rituals coming from the South of Europe. So these cults belong to a religious and cultural lineage according to which nature is sacred, gender is fluid, altered state of consciousness, including sexuality, are embedded in rituals to provide a personal experience of the divine, and at the same time promoting equality, tolerance and healing. During Greek and Roman times, women and men looked into these practices for liberation from the constraints of a society that was increasingly patriarchal, militarized, hierarchical, homophobic, misogynist. Their practices and values questioned the very core of the newly born patriarchal culture, and because of their revolutionary potential, they were brutally repressed. So now that the cultural paradigm that enforced the repression of this cult, of this cultural and religious lineage is crumbling down, the question is what would be the next evolutionary phase of this lineage? And will the new ecstatic revelers be able to translate also in political terms the revolutionary potential of their values and their belief system. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. That's fantastic. So, I'll just use this. Um, so we have some time for a look. Maybe. Ha. We have some time for questions. Um, I'll take my kind of host prerogative and just jump in first so you've got time to think about what you want to ask. I can't remember what I was going to ask. Oh, that was fantastic. But uh, I was thinking about the kind of similarities between the Dionysian cult and the Asclepian cult, which was a kind of very much a, a kind of watered down version in many ways. I kind of talked about this on Friday uh, about the kind of ancient dream temple tradition because they have a lot of kind of symbolic similarities in their Dionysian, Dionysus was aligned with Asclepius in some respects. They had this staff, this, this the fire staff, but with the, uh, the pine cone and the fennel stalk, but with the serpent going up it as well. And they also made use of animal skins. It was thought they kind of did a live a sacrifice, and they would lie inside the animal skins uh, and go into a dream state for healing. So you mentioned healing there, but I was wondering what were the connections as as a kind of as a healing ritual in the cult. Um, well, for example, when I was talking about uh, the Orebazia, the women ritual on the mountains, the healing part was a lot having to do with uh, giving vent to frustration and being able to go deeply into their more emotional world, which was completely repressed in their everyday life. So I can imagine a lot of healing there, of being free to just go crazy and be irrational. Now it's not easy to describe these states. <laughs> and uh, I think there was healing there, and there was healing in being together also then with men, probably, in being able to experience that kind of energy that is created in those kinds of rituals that some of us are starting to reproduce <laughs> in a more uh, experimental ways, uh, and some of us still have no idea what that would look like, but also the fact that now it's spontaneously re-emerging, it shows that there is a kind of need from the human soul to perform these rituals. So a kind of need that can manifest as healing also. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean catharsis as well, you know, no doubt. Yes. Um, so questions from the floor, comments? Okay. Hands up, please. I'm a bit of a, a nervous public speaker, so I'm probably going to jumble my words a little bit. But um, um, it's more of a statement than a question, I guess. Um, 
do you not feel in society, in Western society in particular, that we're, we're sort of returning to a cult of Dionysus in that um, there's a sort of blurring of the lines of um, sexuality and um, I, I'm going to say that, that, that when I walk along the street in London in particular, um, I see couples walking along and from behind I can't really tell which is the female and which is the male. <laughs> So again, you know, not really a statement, sorry, not, not really a question, but more of a statement that we're, we're sort of returning to uh, the blurring of the lines of sexuality, aren't we? Yes, also the fact that so many people came, I think, testifies to this, for sure. Blurring of the lines, finally, like being closer to what is the reality of nature that is not black and white. And patriarchal culture, in a way, was trying to impose this vision vision of reality as black and white. And now, more normal, natural reality is finally reemerging. Uh, thank you very much. That was such a great talk. Um, so much to think about. I, I just wanted to ask you about the galley, and I suppose it's inevitable that some bloke is going to ask you about the boats who cut their bulls off. But um, um, I mean, if, if you're well past puberty um, you, you, and you, um, you lose your, your testicles, you, you still have your sexual potency. So I'm, I'm not sure that they were sexless. And I, I think the hijras and the, the eunuchs in the old uh, uh, the, the Turkish harems had, had quite a raunchy sex life. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's about, it's about transcending sexuality. I think it might be more to do with moving away from the more kind of fundamentalist masculinity that you were referring to with, with uh, the Roman state and the, the militaristic culture. Yeah, they were actually famous for being licen licentious, yes. licentious, how do you say? And they were also saying that women really liked them because they could not get pregnant. So it was a good uh, way to be with a man without the fear of getting pregnant. And so, yeah, they were still active, it looks like, and um, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I got lost. Um, I think you've answered it really, because I, 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 was, I was just questioning um, the, sex, the sexless nature of it. Ah, yeah, and what I wanted to say is that there is another ancient quote that says this castration symbolizes the end of the race towards infinity. So in a way, this masculine energy of just uh, men in theory can have as many children as they want. They are much more uh, prone to having lots of children than women, that with women uh, biology, it's a more limited. So it was also a way to enter into this non-reproductive world and trying to stop this possibility of infinite, infinite these infinite possibilities. I, th I really like that quote. So thank you for allowing me to talk about it. There's a question from Ben. Um, Kia ora, thank you for a wonderful talk. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, just open-ended question about your as you finished, um, how you view this translating into political? <laughs> well, I wanted to mention this political aspect because right now in Italy there is a huge debate over the so-called civil unions. So the possibility of granting um, homosexual couples, the possibility to adopt children and to adopt the child of the other one. And it's a huge debate and they can never finish to talk about it. And there is a lot of uh, demonstrations against it. It's still such a debated issue, such a hot topic that, you know, if uh, there is a counterculture, an underlying culture that believes that everybody has the right of, uh, of being together with the same rights as the heterosexual couples, we should be able to enforce this also in, in society because otherwise it doesn't make, make any sense to practice these rituals, to practice other state of consciousness, to learn all these things from these kind of rituals and not to enact them at the political level. I think we are really in this border. So I hope that, for example, this would, would have been an example that 
we participate in demonstrations and we send our energy towards the uh, making of this law that is going to recognize uh, homosexual couples with the same rights as heterosexual couples. This is just a small example. Then there is also all the other side about alter state of consciousness and cognitive freedom to fight for the right mm -hmm. to learn the way we want. If we learn by altering our consciousness, it should be our choice. We should be free to choose to do that without risking to go to jail. And this is another important battle that we are fighting. So yeah, we need to go on on this point, not just on the partying side, on the uh, ceremonies side. Yeah, great. Hello. <laughs> uh, sorry, a bit loud on mic. Um, your talks sort of touch on uh, Katol Hoyok and India, sort of supposedly Christian Europe in the 7th century. Um, I was wondering how far you feel there is a transmission of these ecstatic techniques or whether perhaps you feel it's an impulse that uh, people are acting on when they are um, performing these rites. I, I got the impression that perhaps you were suggesting that there is a little bit of transmission from Katalhoyok to Greece, to, to Minoan culture, to mm -hmm. Greece, to Rome, to Western mm. Europe, with the witchcraft perhaps. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I get that wrong? Or? Well, in a way, yes. I was trying to show that there is a lineage there, but I don't want to say that that is the only lineage. Because this same cultural lineage with the shamanic practices, practices of altered state of consciousness, spaces of gender experimentation, these are common to every culture all over the world. And actually in this talk I wanted to say that actually even us in Europe we used to do that. Because we are used to talk about Siberian shamanism or South American uh, ceremonies in the jungle, but actually also we have our own tradition and we can reclaim that. And so, yeah, Chatal Huyuk, Minoan culture, but Chatal Huyuk is primitive goddess culture, which was very common, it was like a substrata that is common to many other places. And then with time, it branched out in different forms, in different cultural adaptations. So it's not only one lineage, it's a common, it's a human need of the soul, this is what I believe. And so it's very hard to repress. That's why it's coming back up, because it's a need of the soul. It's a need for healing. It heals trauma. And we need this. And so because it's a, a need that is uh, hardwired inside us, it spontaneously reemerges every time that we reach a cultural point where we're not going to be killed, basically. Maybe we are incarcerated, but we're not killed. So it comes back up. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, what occurred to me uh, was um, that it's evident that this ecstatic need, this, this need to express ourselves religiously, ecstatically, keeps coming up because it's inherent in us. But there's a huge amount of people throughout each revival of this, pre-Christian, Roman, Christian, and now with what's going on in the world uh, today and with Islamic State, that there is a huge amount of people that have the in impulse, which is the opposite, which is to just destroy it. So um, not everybody obviously has this impulse. Or not everybody admits it. <laughs> but we don't know if the repressors are those that don't feel the need. Maybe they don't recognize it in themselves and they don't want to acknowledge it or sure, admit it. it. I'm interested in this interplay between these two sides of culture, the repressive and the, the mainstream and the counterculture. I'm still trying to define, I still don't have it clear, what are these two energies playing with each other. Because in the evolution of the ecstatic cult in the West, what I've been researching, you can see these two energies playing like this. One, one time, the counterculture, I don't know if I can call it like this, but the ecstatic people 
takes more space in the culture, other times they are repressed and there is this continuous interplay. It's a very interesting theme, I keep on researching it and uh, yeah, not necessarily the repressors are those that don't feel it because actually in the Bache, Penteus is representing the king of Thebes, he's representing the institutions and the conservative elite. And actually he's very interested in the rituals, he's very curious about what they do and Dionysus is playing with him on this point. Ah, but wouldn't you like to come and see what they do on the mountains? And Penteus says, I would give a lot of gold in order to be able to do that. Then you have to dress like a woman to do it. What? I will never dress like a woman. Well, but if you want to go and you really want to go, you said you have to. So slowly, slowly, Dionysus seduces him to go on the mountain. So, also the repressor probably has an inner curiosity, that, but not the courage to express it. Hi, thank you for the talk, it's very, very interesting. Um, do you think the fact that in those, in ancient classical Greek and Roman times, that there was a lot of public figures which would eventually, at certain points, be known to be parts of these rituals, join these cults, uh, people that we know the names of. Yes. And so therefore, even though they had a part in public life, I, they may be listened to yeah, democratically or uh, in the assembly or religiously. Do you think that helped preserve this for a longer time? Whereas in the modern day, a politician couldn't come out and say they practice these kinds of things and expect to have the backing of the establishment. So do you think this is a this is something that that kind of the reason it lasted for so long is such you know not changing so much was because it was there was less this division between the people in power and the people like you know it was tied up to democracy in ancient Greece so to speak that kind of thing. the thing is that in those days it was still pagan culture and this plurality of divinity was more accepted so Dionysus was another god was not a very conventional god, but he was a god. So somehow there was this uh, respect towards his practices because he was still an ancient practice that many people knew that had to be respected. And actually during the repression of the Bacchanals, there is a part of the speech of, um, of the consul where he's trying to convince the citizens of Rome that it's good to repress this god because he knows that many people are not going to agree, but he's a god, we cannot repress the sacred stuff. And he says, yeah, but he's a foreign god. We have to worship our gods. So only Roman gods are the right gods. And Dionysus is not the right god. But he takes the time to try to convince them that this is okay to repress these rituals, because it was not so uh, acceptable for a lot more people that maybe more than now, because we have lost this sense of sacredness of these practices. This is also another part of the re-emergence of ecstatic practices, is recognizing their spiritual dimension. It's very difficult for a lot of people, even just realizing the spiritual dimension of sexuality as a technique of ecstasy, or a spiritual dimension of the ingestion of, alters, of uh, psychotropic plants. Back then, they were still more aware of it, and it was more part of their culture. They accepted it more. It already created issues. This is what I wanted to, to show. This ambivalence. It's God, but it's difficult to accept him as a God, but still is sacred. Any questions? Yeah, it's on here. Uh, Go on, if you could. Yeah, 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 it's it just terrible in here. I'll repeat myself. Okay. Um, I just wonder, um, what's your opinion on the co about the corn? Because like, the, the one that the they have... Corn. Yeah, the corn. Yeah. It's... Yeah, you can see it like, if you go to the British Museum, like the Sumerian hieroglyphs, they, the Sumerian gods, they have the corn. Mm -hmm. Or you can find it also in like Vatican or... Mm -hmm. And some cultures, like, they use it as a representation of pineal gland. Yeah, it's true. Okay. And why do you think, like, because when I saw the, the paintings and with the wand and these people, why also these people use cone as to symbolize something? 
why, why, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I didn't make that connection with the pineal gland, but that can be an interesting connection. These people were masters of altered state of consciousness. Yeah, exactly. They were extremely skillful, so they knew much more than we do also about these connections with pineal gland or whatever. What I knew was that it's an evergreen plant again, the pine, and so it was another uh, symbol of um, non-life that doesn't die, because it's evergreen. But probably there is also other kinds of rev um, connections with that symbology. Yeah, thank and you. They will have maybe if they got it from the Sumerians, because Sumerians existed before that. We don't know, <laughs> probably. Well, the cult was coming from Asia Minor, so there were probably influences also coming from there. But yeah, we don't really know, I think. We can make a, a hypothesis, theories. Uh, just one last question, I was just going to jump, jump in if I can. Uh, and I was, I was asking about, curious about the actual use of the plants and the wines, because I know there's some speculation about ancient Greek wines, and they weren't very strong in terms of alcohol, you know, people have these kind of great revels and there's thought there was other plants involved, maybe some of the kind of witching plants that are available in, in the old world at that time, so kind of henbane, belladonna, opium. opium, you think as well, is there any kind of, uh, any information about what plant substances were in there? This question is always asked <laughs> in all the talks, I was waiting for the question, which plants were they <laughs> Well, we know about mushrooms, because mushrooms sometimes are represented. There is that image of the Meta and Persephone with the mushroom in the middle, and one of them is giving the mushroom to the other. It's used a lot in this modern scholarship of people trying to make these kind of connections. Then there is a, a Cretan goddess statue where she's wearing a crown with the opium, opium seed. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, fermented honey. Is it any, any cannabis at all? I don't know. Uh, probably, but I don't know. <laughs> the frigates were big cannabis users. Yeah, probably. I didn't find in the books that I read, but uh, there is a lot more books that I should read. So, <laughs> And I know that there are books talking about cannabis in the classic times, so probably. Yeah, I, I like to stress the mushroom use, because this was very common everywhere, it's and natural. these people were going on the mountains, so... <coughs> okay, I think we just have time for one last question. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous, but uh, what you were talking, you reminded me of the dancing plague for Dance Mania that was happening in Middle Age in Europe, where people were affected uh, by an epidemic of dance for, for hours and weeks. And today, uh, scientists, uh, they coined uh, those epidemics as, um, as an illness, as a symptoms. It's mass psychogenic disorder. Mm. And um, I was wondering, I mean, you have, you think it, you're saying that it's, it's from the soul, it's the need of the soul, it's, it's, it's really a, a romantic vision, but do you think there's a link with the science and, and, um, and with that disorder which is still happening today? So, there is uh, one of the scholars that talks about Dionysus, he makes that specific reference. He says, Ma, maybe these melodic rituals were manifestations similar to those happening in the Middle Ages and later of this mass uh, hyster hysteria. Uh, phenomenons. But then there is also other scholars that say you cannot really make this comparison because it was really small groups of women doing it. It was not so contagious that everybody was going crazy. It was small groups of women consciously deciding to go to the mountains to have this experience. It was not something happening in all of a sudden in everyday life in the streets of the city. So I think there is a difference there. And um, yeah, if it's if it's a psychosis, if it's a sickness, I think this it's this point of ambiguity, something that is a medicine and a poison at the same time. It's a sickness and the cure of the sickness at the same time. And Dionysus brings madness, but also he cures madness. So we have to stay in this ambivalent point, I think. It's
on that point, we've got wine. Uh, we don't have any mushrooms, I don't think, but and you can stay with bars still open for a while. And just join me in thanking Cara for a wonderful time.